Hello, welcome back. The title of this lesson is called The Law of Cosines, and this is part one. So we have three goals in this lesson. The first one is to introduce and write down the law of cosines for you and explain why we care and why it's useful. And it's a tool to solve triangles, right? That's the big picture. We're gonna get into why and what it is in just a second. That's goal number one. Goal number two is I like to solve some problems to give you practical experience using the law of cosines. You'll find out that it's pretty easy to use once you know what you're doing. And number three, at the end of the lesson, I'm gonna prove the law of cosines to you. So not only when you know what it is and what it's for and how to use it, but by the end of the lesson, you'll know exactly where it comes from. You'll know how to prove it. And the proof of it, usually I don't do too many proofs or not, I don't do proofs for everything. But in this case, the proof of the law of cosines is really useful because you learn where it comes from, but you also, the tools that I have to kind of go over with you for the proof, they're actually things that we're gonna use later on anyway in math. So they're very useful, and so that's why I feel like it's a good idea to go over that. And so you know where it comes from, and you get a little practice with, with the proof. And the proof is not difficult to understand, so I encourage you to, to, to stick with me to get there. Now we all know about right triangles, right? Right triangles are probably the most useful kind of triangle we have, and uh, we, we can use it for all kinds of problems, right? But just to refresh your memory, here is what a right triangle is. Now there's a 90 degree angle uh, here, and this is gonna dovetail into the, to the law of cosines in just a second, so stick with me here, right? But if we have a, a angle C, right, and angle B, and angle A with the capital letters, then, what we do is we say, all right, opposite this angle over here, we have lowercase a, opposite this angle here, we have a lowercase b, and opposite this angle, we have lowercase c. Now we already know from, you know, in the past that we have what we call the famous Pythagorean theorem, which uh, uh, applies to right triangles like this one. And we know that c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. So if you know it's a right triangle with a 90 degree angle and you know uh, any two of these sides, you can use the Pythagorean theorem to find the, the value of the third side, right? The hypotenuse is, is, is well always called C and it's the longest side of the triangle opposite 90 degrees. Now, it's really useful, but what happens if you don't have a right triangle? What if you have some other random shaped triangle? Are we just stuck? Do we not have any tools? Well, the answer is we're not stuck. We have, in this lesson, we're gonna talk about the law of cosines, which applies to any triangle. And then later on, we're gonna talk about the law of sines, which is a totally separate equation, and it's for different situations, but it also applies to all triangles. So for here, let's talk about this law of cosines. First, without proving anything, we're just gonna write it down. So let's go ahead and talk about the situation when we have a general shape triangle, which is different. Now, of course, this doesn't look like a great triangle because it's got a curved, a little curved line on the side, so sorry about that, but you get the idea. If I draw a straight line like this and I have a triangle, this is not a right triangle because there is no 90 degree angle in any of these places. But I can do the same kind of thing, right? I can say this is angle A up here, and this I can call angle B, and this one over here I can call angle C. And so opposite of angle A, I can call it lowercase a, that's the length of this side A. Opposite angle B, I can call it lowercase b. Opposite angle C, I can do lowercase c like this. So I have A, B, and C. Now what the law of cosines says, law of cosines, is what it does is it, it is a modified form of the Pythagorean theorem. So you're going to see similarities. It's gonna look like the Pythagorean theorem with uh, an additional thing at the end of it which changes it a little bit because it's not a right triangle. So let me show you what that is. Let's do it in blue. The law of cosines, for the first way we're gonna write it, is the following. C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared. And you're like, wait a minute, that's exactly what we have here. Yes, it's the Pythagorean theorem with one more thing at the end. So the length of this, uh, of this side C is equal to A squared plus B squared but then we have minus two times a times b times the cosine of c, the angle c. So first, before you even talk about it, just, just convince yourself that this looks exactly like the Pythagorean theorem with one additional subtracted term at the end. So it's because it's not a 90 degree angle here causing a right triangle that this causes us to have to have this extra term. So it's a squared plus b squared minus two times whatever you have here, a, b, and notice that a and b are right here on the triangle. 
and we have cosine of C here, which is the angle between A and B. So the way it works is, it's the Pythagorean theorem, C squared is A squared plus B squared, minus two times the lengths of these two sides that we have written here, times the cosine of the angle that is between them. That's why it's called the law of cosines, because we have this cosine here. Now, this is if you're trying to really find the length of side C here. But we can write this law of cosines for the other sides as well. Let's see how the pattern unfolds. B squared is uh, the length of this side squared is going to be the other two sides squared, A squared plus C squared, right? Because if we have one letter over here, the other two letters exist on the other side. But then we have to have minus two times these letters, A times C times the cosine, of, here's A and C, the angle between. The angle between is angle B, O sine of angle B. So B squared is A squared plus C squared minus two A times, uh, A squared plus C squared minus two AC times cosine of B. Now let me write the third one down and we'll talk about it again. What if we wanna find side A, A squared? Then it's gonna be the other two sides squared, B squared plus C squared, but then I gotta subtract two times these two sides, B times C, times the cosine, here's B and C, of the angle between, which is angle A. So this is how I want you to remember the law of cosines. A lot of students just try to memorize them and they don't know, like they don't know what they're really, they don't really see the pattern. So they're just trying to memorize three completely separate equations without understanding the pattern. The pattern is in a general triangle without any 90 degree angle then the length of one side squared is just the other two sides squared added together, so in this case, A and B squared added together, minus two times these same two sides times the cosine of the angle between. In this case, between A and B is the angle C. That's the first equation. If we're trying to find B, it's the other two sides squared minus two times these multiplied, A times C, and then A times C, the cosine of the angle between is cosine angle B. And finally, if you're trying to find the length of the side A squared, it's the other two sides squared, B squared plus C squared, minus two times the same two sides, BC, times the cosine, here's B and C, of A, which is the angle between them. And these are the law of cosines written for uh, whatever side you're trying to find, either A or B or C. Now they're squared, so once you calculate the right side, you'll have to take the square root to, to get these, these A, B, and C, but that's what it is. Now, let's, back up the truck a little bit and cover up these bottom two, just ignore them right there. And let's say this is a general triangle, right? Notice the right triangle has a 90 degree on the location of C, on angle C is, is 90 degrees in this case. What if we take the law of cosines right here and what if we make angle C 90 degrees? In other words, let's put a 90 degree angle in here. What is cosine of 90 degrees? Well, if you think back to trig, cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So if you put 90 degrees in for this angle, you get cosine of zero, which is zero, which kills this whole term. And then the case of a 90 degree angle here, C squared is A squared plus B squared, and all of this disappears. So in the case that you make one of the angles 90 degrees, you get the Pythagorean theorem back, okay? If you make C 90 degrees, you get exactly the Pythagorean theorem back. If you make B 90 degrees, which will be uh, this angle right here, then you get a, a different looking Pythagorean theorem, but your 90 degree angle is in a different place. So A and B and C are, are relabeled. That's why it looks a little different, but it is still the Pythagorean theorem. So I guess I'm just trying to point out to you that the law of cosines truly is just a modified form of the Pythagorean theorem. Even if you take one of the angles and make it 90 degrees, then the law of cosines one of the terms drops away and you're left with the same Pythagorean theorem that we learned way back in the beginning. C squared is A squared plus B squared. Notice that C was always the letter opposite of the 90 degree angle. So this is kind of like the prime law of cosines and the other ones are just written for the other sides. So now that we kind of understand generally what it is, let's go ahead and solve a couple of quick problems and then stick with me to the end because then we're gonna prove this. We're gonna start from the beginning and we're gonna actually prove that this thing is true. So you know exactly where it comes from. All right, so let's do that. Let's go over here and I think we can solve the first problem just right underneath here. Let's say that I give you that a general triangle, it's not 90 degrees, that the value of A is equal to six and the value of side B is equal to seven and the value of the angle C is equal to 20 degrees. 
and I want you to tell me, tell me what side C is equal to. So the first step you should always do is draw a picture. So draw a picture. Don't draw a 90 degree triangle though, because this is not a 90 degree triangle, right? But you have uh, angle A and you have angle B and you have angle C. And then opposite angle A is, is side A and opposite angle B is side B and opposite angle C is side C. So now that you have these in place, you can actually list or put the, uh, the, the, um, the measurements on here. So you know side A is equal to six. Side B here is, I'll put a equal to seven right there. Measure of angle C, which is opposite this one here, this one's 20 degrees, like this, that's what he, is here, and we're trying to find this one. That's what we're trying to find, side C. So because we're trying to find side C, we look up here and we say, well, we're just gonna use the first one because it's already solved for C squared. So we're gonna write it down, and we're gonna say that C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared minus two times the same two, AB, times the cosine of uh, the angle between, which is the cosine of C, right? If you don't remember that, then you just copy it down, but I'm trying to also teach you how to remember it. So C squared is equal to A squared. A is six, so six squared, plus B squared, B is seven, so we'll put seven squared here, minus two times A times B, so six times seven, times the cosine of the angle between. Angle C is 20 degrees. And you can see that we know all of these numbers, so we can then solve for them. C squared uh, is equal to 6 times 6 is 36. Uh, 7 times 7, 49. And then minus here. Uh, the 2 times the 6 times the 7 is going to give you 84. And the cosine of 20 degrees, when you put that in the calculator, get 0 0.9397. That's the cosine there. And the rest of it is just straight math. So C squared. When you take this plus this and you subtract, well, I guess I'll do the, these two together. 80, it'll be 85. And then this here, when you multiply these two numbers together, you get 78.9342. And then C squared, when you take 85 minus this, you get 6.0058. 6.00, let's see here, C squared, no, no, not 0058. Sorry about that. It is 6.0658, 6 6 sorry about that. Now to solve for C, see this is what C squared is equal to. To solve for C, we take the square root of both sides. So the value here of C when you take the square root, 2.42 or 4629, which is approximately equal to 2.46. So this is what I'm gonna circle for the value of C, 2.46. So 2.4629 approximately equal to 2.46. Now, be honest with yourself. Yes, it's a little bit of math, but it's really not that hard. It's literally plugging numbers in and following order of operations. We know we have to square first, we do that, and we have to do the multiplication, we do that. Cosine is in there, and then we have to do left to right addition and subtraction. Once we get the answer, we have to square root both sides to get rid of the square that is over here. All right? So that's the law of cosines for the first problem. Now let's solve Problem number two, right? Let's say that I tell you that C, the side C is equal to 15 you know, centimeters or whatever. And I tell you that side B is equal to 30 centimeters or whatever it is. And I tell you that angle A is equal to 140 degrees. And I ask you, tell me what side A is equal to. Tell me what side A is equal to. So first we always draw a picture. Now, because one of these angles is so big, I'm gonna draw the triangle a little differently because I know one of these angles is a large open triangle. So I know it's gonna look something like this. I mean, I don't really know exactly what it looks like, but I know it has to be open. I'm gonna say this is side A, or this is angle A, sorry. This is angle B, this is angle C, and then this will be side A, opposite here, side B, opposite here, side C. Why did I draw it like this? Because then I could draw one of these angles at 140 degrees. That's very open, right? And then I, uh, C was equal to 15, so that's 15 over here. B was equal to 30, 30 over here. So this is the information I have, and I'm trying to find side A. That's what I want to calculate. So let's figure out what do we want to do. Well, we don't really want to use this law of cosines because we don't even know. Uh, we, we need to be able to take the cosine of one of the angles. But you see, we only know one of the angles. We only know angle A. We don't know angle B or angle C. 
So we want to use the law of cosines that has the cosine of the angle we have, and it's also solved for a squared, and that's what we're trying to find. So we're going to write this one down. So it's going to be a squared uh, is equal to the other two, b squared plus c squared minus two times whatever you have here, b times c times the cosine of the other, of the other letter, the angle that's between uh, B and C is angle A. So that's what we have, 2BC cosine uh, angle A. All right, so what is side B? That's 30, so we have 30 squared. What is side C? That's 15, so we have 15 squared minus two times BC, which is 30 times 15, times the cosine of the angle between. The angle between is 140 degrees. That's exactly why we use this one because that's the only angle we know we can take the cosine of that angle. Now these are all just simply numbers we can calculate. So 30 times 30, and this is by the way a squared, sorry about that, it should be a squared. So 30 squared is 900, uh, 15 uh, squared is 225, and then the 2 times the 30 times the 15 is 900. When we take the cosine of 140 we get negative 0 0.766 in a calculator. And then we have a squared. Uh, when we have nine, uh, let's see, 900 plus 225, we get 1125. And then what we have negative times negative is positive, so this becomes a positive 689.4 when we multiply these together. So we get 1125 plus 689.4, so we have a squared is 1814.4. We add these guys together, but that's a squared. So to get rid of that, we take the square root of both sides, so we take the square root of this we get 42.6, and that's the answer for uh, the side A, 42.6. So if this was in centimeters, for instance, then that would be 42.6 centimeters. So now we've introduced the law of cosines. I've tried to encourage you to understand that it's just a modified form of the Pythagorean theorem that's true for any triangle of any shape with any angles. And then we did two examples to show you how to use it. And normally I don't prove everything, but I want to prove this one for you. I want you to know where it comes from, but also because the tools that we'll need for the proof, which are not hard by the way, but they are things that we use constantly throughout math class. So I feel like this proof is a really good one because the things that I'm gonna talk about, you're gonna use them forever, basically. So let's talk about where this law of sines, or law of cosines comes from. So first, I'm gonna introduce a couple of tools. Some of you, may already know these tools. That's great. Some of you may have no idea what I'm talking about, but that's okay because it's very easy to understand these tools anyway. So let's go back to a unit circle, right? What does a unit circle mean? You need this for the, for the proof, so we're going to talk a little bit about a unit circle. A unit circle is just a circle centered at the origin that has a radius of one. So that means this is one, and this is one, and this is negative one, and this is negative one. That's what a unit circle is, right? Now, we already know all about unit circles from understanding sine and cosine. So let's draw a radius of one, because notice it's a radius, uh, uh, it's a circle of radius one, so any distance from the origin to the circle has a distance of one. And we can break this, uh, we can break this kind of like this hypotenuse, we can, or this length, we can split it up vertically into a kind of a, like a make a little right triangle here. We've done this, right? That's what we talked about sine and cosine. And I've been telling you over and over again that the vertical side here is if this is an angle of theta, right, where it's up there like this, that this vertical uh, uh, side of this triangle here is called the sine of the angle theta. And this distance right here, this is called the cosine of angle theta. So basically, if you have a unit circle with a hypotenuse of length one, and you know the angle here, if you take the sine of the angle, you get the length of this triangle, which is just literally the hypotenuse of one, it's shadow projection onto the y-axis basically right here. How much of that hypotenuse, kind of fractionally, is existing in the vertical direction? That's what you're doing. You're taking the shadow projection along the y-axis, right? That's what the sine of an angle is. The cosine of an angle is taking the shadow projection of that hypotenuse onto the x-axis. So that's why we call it the x component and the y component when the hypotenuse is one. Right? But we know that this is a right triangle in here, and so we know that the Pythagorean theorem holds for any right triangle. So we know c squared is always equal to a squared plus b squared because this forms a right triangle. But what is c in this case? It's just the uh, length of one. It's a unit circle. So we can put the length of c being one squared. And what is side a? Well, side a and b can be either one of these guys, but you can see that 
uh, side A, you can consider, uh, let's call it sine here, sine. So sine of the angle. We just said this side of the triangle was sine of the angle. And we can put it in for the value of A. And then the value of B, the other side of the triangle, we already said it's the cosine of the angle. So it's the cosine of the angle, and that's squared. So what have we figured out here? That we have 1 squared is 1, and this we can write as sine squared of the angle, and this we can write as cosine squared of the angle. Let me flip it around. Sine squared of any angle plus cosine squared of any angle is equal to 1. This is an identity that we're actually going to learn a little bit later in class. It's called the Pythagorean trig identity. Pythagorean trig identity. Do you know why it's called the Pythagorean identity? Well, it comes straight from the Pythagorean theorem. Basically, anytime you have a unit circle, you always have a 90 degree angle in there, so you have a right triangle. So for any angle around the unit circle, no matter where this thing points, if you take the y projection here, which is the sine of the angle, and the x projection, which is the cosine of the angle, no matter what the angle is, they're always going to add up when you square them to the number one. So sine squared of any angle plus cosine squared of any angle always equals one. Always. Grab a calculator. Pick any angle you want. 87.2 degrees. Take the cosine. 87.2 degrees. Take the sine. Take both of those answers and square them and add them together. And you're always going to get one for any angle because the unit circle and what sine and cosine are, they always form right triangle. And because of Pythagorean theorem, they always, when you square you know, when you take the values and you square them, they're going to always add up to one. So this is incredibly useful. In fact, if I had to pick like one trig identity, if I just had to pick one and say, that's the one I really, really, really want you to remember, this might be the one because it comes up everywhere in math. It's always true and it's so fundamental because it comes from Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so that's tool number one. Let's talk about tool number two. Now the second tool we're going to need, I'll put also, is basically pretty much as important as this. We use it a lot in more advanced math classes. It's very simple to understand. So let's draw a little x, y axis right here. And we'll need both of these to understand where the proof comes from. Let me pick a point anywhere in this x, y plane. Let me pick it over here. And I'm going to say that this is some point and it has coordinates x comma y. That's why I have parentheses x, y. The point P has coordinates x comma y. Now what I'm going to do is draw an arrow which goes from the origin through this point like this. It's supposed to be a straight line, but it might be a little bit curved, okay? Now this, this line is what forms the, the angle where this point exists, the angle to the x-axis right here, okay? And so there's an angle from the x-axis to this little line here, and we're going to call this angle theta. So what we're di uh, dipping our toes into, we're going to get into a little later, it's called polar coordinates, okay? And I'm introducing it now because we have enough information to understand it, and it, we're going to use it in just a second. But it's very simple to understand. When you have a point on the plane, you can represent it as x comma y. That's great. Those are the x, y coordinates. But you can also uh, specify its location by drawing a line from the origin through it and telling me where the angle is. So you can, I can tell you how far along this line it is in this direction, and then also the angle. And any point in the plane, I can tell you the angle of it and its distance from the origin, and I can also specify its location anywhere there, okay? But notice that this point also forms a right triangle. Big surprise. Right triangles are coming up all the time, right? And we already know that if I tell you the distance from this point to the origin is r, uh, like I already told you a second ago, we can specify the point two ways, x comma y, or a distance r from the origin, however many centimeters from the origin and the angle from the x-axis. If the point's here, it might be uh, r could be two centimeters and the angle might be 140 degrees. If r is maybe over here, you know, then maybe, or if the point is over here, maybe the distance from the origin is three centimeters and the angle is like 230 degrees. If the point's like way over here, then maybe the, the R, the distance from the origin is like 10 centimeters and it's at an angle of all the way around to 350 degrees, almost 360 degrees. So you always need two points or two numbers to represent a point in an XY plane. You could just give me X comma Y, or you also could give me two different numbers, R, and theta. Theta tells you the angle where it's at, and R tells you how far away from the origin it is. And you can uniquely identify any point 
anywhere in the xy plane with those two numbers, r, the distance from the origin, and some angle theta from the x-axis. All right, so that's why I put r here. It's the distance away from the origin and at some angle here. That also could be the, the definition of where the point p is. But we know, right, we know that if this is true, then this side of this triangle is r multiplied by the sine of theta. And we know that this distance here is r multiplied by the cosine of theta. How do we know this? Because the cosine of the angle theta here, or the cosine of the angle theta is, uh, is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, and the sine of the angle, I guess I can go over here. You can say that the sine of an angle is its uh, opposite over the hypotenuse. But the hypotenuse is r, right? So the opposite side, which is this side of the triangle, can be written as the hypotenuse times the sine of theta. Basically, what we, what we do is we say, however far this distance is, to give me this side of the triangle, I just take it and I multiply by the sine of the angle, which chops it into the y direction. To find this distance on the x-axis, I take this uh, distance of the, of the number and I multiply by the cosine. So r times the cosine chops it into the x direction. I've been telling you that cosine and sine are like chopping functions the whole time. So if you know a distance from the origin and you multiply by the cosine of the angle where it is, then it chops it and tells you the horizontal distance on the x-axis like this. It chops it and tells you the shadow projection down here. If you take the distance r times the sine of the angle, it gives you the shadow projection into this direction. This is what we've been doing all the time. So once we know that we can do this, then we can specify the point two ways. P can be specified in an x comma y fashion, but if the x coordinate of this point P, we can write it as uh, we can write it as r times cosine of theta, and the y coordinate can be written as r times the sine of theta. What we're basically saying is this point, it forms a triangle, right? And we just said that this side of it was r times the cosine of theta, and this side was r times the sine of theta. So the x coordinate, which is this, literally this coordinate along this axis, is r times cosine of theta. So the x component can be written as r times the cosine of theta, and the y component of this point can be written as r times the sine of theta. So I'm getting a little bit into polar coordinates because we're gonna be doing a lot more with it very, very soon. But we have enough now to write down our proof of the law of cosines. All right, so two things. Anytime you have an angle, sine squared plus cosine squared is one. That's fact number one. Fact number two, any point in the xy plane can be written as an xy coordinate pair, but the x coordinate can be written as r times the cosine of the angle it makes makes with the x-axis. And the y-coordinate can be written as r times the sine, because r times the cosine gives you the x-projection, and r times the sine gives you the y-projection, and those are the xy-coordinates that we have. So now, let's do the proof of the law of cosine. So I, I build it up so much, it seems like it's so difficult, but really, it's, it's really not. So let's go ahead and do that right here. And we're gonna draw this like this. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw a general triangle. A general triangle goes up, and then maybe goes down like this. There's no 90 degree angle. I'm not, I'm not giving any, any 90 degree angle there, okay? So we can say that uh, this is point B or angle B. We could say this is angle C, and I'm gonna call this point P. I guess you could call it angle A, but I'm gonna call this point P uh, here. Or I guess you could just say that this is point C and point B, and this is point uh, P here, and it's X comma Y, right? X comma Y. Now we also know that this angle is angle C right here, all right? So this xy point, any point in the xy plane, any point, the x, x coordinate can be written as r times the cosine of whatever the angle is, and y can be written as r times the sine of whatever the angle is. Now you might be telling me like, well, what, what are you talking about? I'm saying that this point P, you can write it as a distance from the origin at some angle. And this angle is gonna end up being angle C right here. But in general, you can say that the X coordinate is gonna be, can be written as the distance R times the cosine here. And then the Y coordinate is R times the sine. All right? So actually, instead of putting theta here, I'm gonna erase theta, and I'm gonna say that this is actually angle C. So let's talk about why, because 
if I draw a little dotted line down here, I'm saying that this distance right here is, uh, this distance right here is, if this is side B, and this is side C, and this down here, this whole entire distance here is, I'll just put A right here, the whole distance here, then this distance right here is B times the cosine of angle C. B times the cosine of angle C. And this distance right here, when I go over here, this is B times the sine of angle C. So make sure you understand that. All I'm saying is I'm drawing a triangle here, here's a point, and this is what we're gonna use to prove the thing. But if you know that the length of this side of the triangle is B, then B times the cosine of this angle is gonna give you this distance, and B times the sine of this angle is gonna give you this distance. Now, what we want to do is use the Pythagorean theorem. I want you to tell me the length of C. So find, this is gonna prove it for us, find length of side C. Find the length of side C. So we're, we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem. So we're gonna say that C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared, right? But if this is C, then what is the other side of the triangle? We have this side right here and we have this side right here, all right? So if we want this side of the triangle, if A the, is the entire length here, then what we have here is A minus B cosine of angle C squared. That would be just this side of the triangle. The entire side is A, minus this little side gives us this. What we're trying to do is find the length of this side. So C squared is this side squared plus this side squared, but this side is the entire length A minus B cosine C squared, right? And then we have the other side of the triangle, which is given right here, B times uh, the sine of C squared. Make sure uh, you understand this before we go on any farther. I'm just saying that we're gonna find the length of side C. It's going to be the other side of the triangle, this, squared, and it's gonna be this side of the triangle squared. But this side of the triangle squared is the whole length A. A is the whole length minus this little bit. And so that is what is squared. This is really all we need. Now we have to just do the math. So C squared is equal to, now we have this binomial, we gotta square it. It's the first term squared, A squared, minus two times A times B. So A, then times this stuff, B cosine C, right? Uh, so a squared minus two times a times b, right? And then we have to go plus this stuff squared. When we square it, we get b squared cosine squared c, right? b squared cosine squared uh, c. And then finally we have this one. We're gonna square every term inside of here. b squared sine squared c. So we um, remember square every little term inside. So for this, we had to do a binomial you know, we have to do FOIL basically. So it's the first term squared minus two times the first term times the second term. Then we squared the second thing. So it becomes plus this squared. Then we have this squared. All right, we're getting there. I know it seems very, very much like we're not, but we're getting there. Now we want to group terms together. C squared is going to equal A squared. All right. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to write this term and this term next to each other. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write b squared sine squared c, that's this term, plus b squared cosine squared c, that's this term. And then I'm gonna write this term last, minus two a b cosine of c, all right? So what do we have here? We have a squared, we have a b squared, we can pull it out, we can factor that out. So b squared, on the inside, what do we get? All that's left is sine squared of the angle c, cosine squared, of the angle C, we have the plus sign there, and then we have minus two AB cosine of C. But look what we have. We just said that for any angle, sine squared plus cosine squared of the same angle is equal to one, for any angle. And here we have sine squared of the angle C plus cosine squared of the angle C, so this whole term just goes to one. So what do we have left? We have c squared is equal to a squared plus this b squared times one, so it all disappears, minus two times a times b times the cosine of the included angle c, and this is the famous law of cosines. So two, I'm sorry, c is c squared is a squared plus b squared minus two ab cosine c. So from the top, general triangle, no 90 degree angles, here is a point up here. 
let's find the distance c. So c squared is the other two sides of the right triangle, this is a right triangle, squared. So this side is squared, but this side we just said we can write it as this side b times the sine of this angle c. So this becomes squared, that's where that is. This side squared is the whole side squared minus this little part, a minus, and this was b cosine of this uh, angle c here. So that's what that side is there. So this entire subtraction is what this little side is and we have to square it. Then we do kind of foil on it. So this squared minus two times a times a times this thing here. And then we have to square the last term. Then we just regroup these two terms together. That's all we did is kind of rewrite the order and bring them here. And then this one we brought toward the end. Then when we factor out, we see that this is one and it all falls away. And the only thing that you really need to understand that is that two pieces of information. When you draw a unit circle, sine squared of any angle plus cosine squared of any angle is one, we went over that. And then the other thing is that in the xy plane, any point, you can write the x coordinate of that point as r cosine theta, where theta is the angle where the point is, and r is the distance from the origin. And when you take it, you chop it down in the x direction, r cosine theta. And then r sine theta is finding the y component there. So this is kind of like getting into, again, I talked about polar coordinates. We're going to have an entire lesson on that. But for the purpose of the proof, all you have to know is that this point in xy, the, y, the x projection and the y projection is r, in this case, b cosine of this angle and b times the sine of this angle. So uh, that's all you need for that. So this is the famous law of cosines. It's applicable to any triangle with any angles. And so we use it quite often. So I'd like you to solve all of these. Make sure you understand the concept. Follow me on to the next lesson. We'll continue to work with the law of cosines.